So, yeah, what are we gonna do? Quick intro barcodes. Uh, I'm gonna talk about encoding, decoding, scanners. Some simple tricks, some more simple tricks. Um, some backend stuff and some unsolved cases and stuff. Um, so, this is actually all not really hard. So, relax, you don't need your brain, or at least, like, the left side of it. Um, what about history of barcodes? Like, they got developed in um, 1948 by two people. And um, the first usage attempt, and that's actually really funny, um, was the American Railroad people that tried to barcode all, um, all the cars that they have. It took them 17 years to label all the cars, and then the system didn't work. Like, it never did. At that point in time, people figured barcodes are useless. Um, however, 1966, um, the National Association of Food Chains um, started to require having barcodes um, on products to speed up the checkout process so they could make more money. And that usually tends to be a really good driver for technology, either making more money or porn. So in 69, um, the same requested a industry standard, which later became the UPC code that you all have on your grocery products and stuff here in the States. And since 81, um, the US Department of Defense required a code 39 barcode on all products that are sold to the military. And um, you will see why that is a bad idea. So in barcode speech, um, the little like barcodes, that, the thing that we just call barcodes are called symbologies. Um, and we have one dimensional symbologies and two dimensional symbologies. Um, here you see a few samples and the smarter ones of you will actually start to notice that um, the R in the samples, and it's probably just hard to read. Um, some of the samples contain only numbers. Some of the samples actually contain letters. So we can actually have letters in barcodes. Here's some more symbologies. Um, we will talk about a few of those in more detail in the talk. Um, this is just an overview. So there's a bunch of different um, symbology standards out there. Um, and they differ mostly in error correction and they differ also in uh, what resolution you can print them in and all kinds of other stuff. So it's really like with protocols, like everyone invents his own. Um, then you have like really weird barcodes, like this, the upper one you've probably seen on envelopes. And this is actually a PostNet barcode. This is actually a routing information for letters. Um, the British always being their separative island folks, um, of course had to invent their own postal barcode that roughly looks the same, but it's the British one. And then we have two dimensional barcodes now. If you look at this graphic and then you look at your batch, who can tell me what type of barcode you have on your batch? Data matrix, that is right. And you will like, probably notice that this data matrix here looks a bit different. It actually has like a cross in the middle. This is because you can cluster them. So you can actually extend the amount of information that goes into a data matrix code. That is true for most two dimensional barcodes. Um, you often see at stake barcodes on UPS parcel. Um, I've rarely seen maxi code except for on stuff that Cisco sent me once in the mail. Um, and PDF barcodes are widely used in Europe um, for ticketing systems and we're gonna co go into those later. Now when you see a barcode and you need to decode it, like how many people raise your hands if you actually decoded the barcode on your batch? Yeah, you kind of like were sitting next to me. <laughs> okay, cool, so some people actually did it. Um, now, are you interested in knowing what's on there? It's a URL, and I'm not telling you which. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems to be part of like a scavenger hunt kind of thing. Um, so essentially, if you wanna decode a barcode, there are two ways. Um, one is you just take a scanner and go like beep, and then see what's on your computer screen. And the other one is decoding software. Um, this is what I use. Um, some decoding software is free. 
Um, other decoding software um, comes for the cost of like a few hundred dollars or the modification of two bytes. Um, and I'm like really lazy, so I went to capitalist way and actually bought one that was really expensive, but it's really good. Um, most scanners actually output the stuff directly into your keyboard loop. And that's the older scanners, you also have USB. Um, so they're actually seen as input devices by the computer. Um, and that makes it really easy, you don't need any special software. So, assume we wanna generate barcodes, how do we do that? Um, so, there is a very good, for one dimensional barcode, so it's a very, very good generator, uh, which is surprising because it is called GNU and it's actually good, and like it even compiles. Um, so this GNU barcode is actually decent and you can like generate a lot of barcodes with it. Um, you can online generate barcodes, there are many PHP scripts and stuff to do that. Um, they're uncountable commercial solution. Um, many of them actually ship as um, true type fonts, which I find kind of weird, but you can do that. Um, you can write your own generator really easily. The fun part is um, you need the specs and the specs actually come in a very, very fucked up form. Like I was actually buying the specs for the ad state code and the way you get them is you get a scanned in uh, printout that was written on a typewriter way back that has like hand corrections in it. And this is what you pay 20 US dollars for. So go figure. But it's really easy, generation is really easy as with everything. So in general, um, barcodes are used for like three different things and I have to excuse the German in the slide but there's just no other way to say it. Um, either they're used as tags and IDs, um, so you're just putting a number on something and tag it, or the two dimensional ones are actually used to, um, as virtual data transport or virtual to physical, because barcodes have this unique property that you can send them by email and then print them out and you get a physical data carrier in your hand that you called email. And this is what people actually use in Europe a lot. I don't know how much it's used here. Um, the third application they're used for is utter bullshit. And we will cover some of that as well. So now we're coming to the first interesting thing about barcodes, the scanners. The scanners that like face outside to a potentially hostile barcode um, are actually configured by barcodes. So you have a scanner, the one side faces to an attacker and the other one is connected to a computer and you actually configure it from the attacker side, which is really stupid. So what happens is this, you have a special like enter configuration mode barcode that ships with every scanner. You scan this enter configuration barcode thingy and then he goes in config mode and then you can scan other barcodes that like change the configuration like the output character set to Japanese or something and then uh, you send a, um, you scan an end of configuration barcode and it gets saved to the scanner. This is really not a good idea. <laughs> I mean you really change how this device works. I've actually seen a scanner that offered software update over barcode um, which was scary. What the hell? So and this is essentially what you do. You go to the vendor's um, page and you know, like you, many vendors actually post the configuration um, barcodes on their web page. Um, you can just like call up the dealer that like sells those barcode scanners um, and then you reconfigure it. You can change the supported barcode types um, which means that the system that formerly thought it's only accepting um, let's say UPC barcodes, now suddenly accept all types of barcodes because one thing that you need to know is all the scanners support all the barcode types. Like you don't buy a separate scanner for a uh, UPC or something. The chipsets became so easy and cheap that like all the scanners support all the barcodes and you have to actually configure them away. So the system that used to only accept UPC with a single, simple, simple configuration, more beer, will suddenly accept pretty much everything you feed it. Not good. Some scanners actually support special key codes. This is cool when you have a cash register system that still runs on MS-DOS, for example. Um, 
There are many of those because they're really stable in contrast to modern operating systems. Um, the thing is, with the special barcode that like has a special key code, you can actually go and scan an escape key. And since it's looped into the keyboard, it actually has the same effect as someone hitting escape on the keyboard, which means it's gonna exit the cache register application. Um, <laughs> quite nicely, um, you can pretty much shut down entire shopping centers. Um, yeah, so the easiest hack in quotes with barcodes is in most cases actually just copying them. Um, if, the, if the barcode actually transports the information that you want already, get a good camera or get a, and get a printer, make a picture, print it out, have a copy of the barcode and use that one as well. Happens so, there is a, stand up, come on. There is this person who actually, um, like at pH neutral, we have those badges, and some of those badges are the alcoholic badges. Like, you can actually get free beer with them. And this guy didn't want to pay beer, but get free beer, so he actually took a picture, thank you, actually took a picture of someone's get free beer badge, and then went to the copy shop and got it printed out and laminated, and like got free beer. Which is why we now have chip cards. <laughs> Another thing, um, like I don't know how common that is here. Uh, much of this is um, European centric. So, so um, many parking systems, like parking garage payment systems, actually use barcodes nowadays in, in our areas. And for the, for the residents, they have like special barcodes. And so I ended up in a, in a hotel and they gave me for a parking place in, in a city in Germany, um, they gave me a long-term pass because I was staying at the hotel and so I didn't have to pay for the parking. Now this long-term pass is just a simple encoded number and I don't need to actually know what this number means because I can just copy it and then like distribute around like free parking passes for the city center, which I actually did. Um, so you guys don't do any of that recycling bullshit. Now, it's really, really bad in Europe. So they make you actually come back, like bring back your empty bottles, and then they make you stand in front of a machine and feed them individually into this machine until you are done. Um, the whole process actually takes longer than drinking the beer. So <laughs> this is really retarded. And they are using um, barcodes that come out of the machine, they get printed out of the machine, and you walk up to the register um, and get your refund for the recycling, right? So, getting paid for drinking beer. Um, the thing is, in those systems, they actually have no connection between the recycling machine and the cash register. That means all the information has to be on the barcode. Like, there is no other way to transport the information. Um, and the vouchers that they use that come out of the machine are EAN 13, which is like our version of UPC. It's just a bit longer. Um, and this EAN 13 is actually the, the super standard that UPC is under. And your UPC is actually missing a leading digit, a zero. That's what, why it's not printed. Um, all other countries have a leading digit that says from which country this product comes. And there are special use digits too, for example, is used for store internal use. Now what I did was like, I actually went, actually I didn't do that, um, someone else did that for me. Um, went to the store and gave back two bottles. And so you see, I'm getting back like 55 cents euro, which is about $2. Um, <laughs> and when you're, when you're checking down here, can I? Nah. Those are all fixed, yeah, I cannot walk around. Um, when you're checking down at the barcode, it actually ends with 0555. Now, if you happen to know that the last digit is actually a checksum, so it's not part of the transported data, it suspiciously looks like the amount of money that you get back. Now, we got a second bottle checked in, and that was 25 cents, and it exhibited the same pattern. So you can actually like count it and see that you can get up to 999 euros in refund for like returning stuff, um, which is actually pretty decent. 
The thing is, um, Berlin is full of people that don't like to work, but to drink a lot of alcohol. Um, and so when they introduced the systems, um, people immediately realized that this is cool um, because they didn't even read the barcode, but they did what I told you earlier. They just copied them in masses and like went into stores and got money. And um, to prevent this, the stores actually started to use like special paper so they would recognize their own paper. But the thing is, if you stick the barcode under your six pack, which is heavy, and uh, the lady at the cash register doesn't like to like lift it up, so they just scan it over. So if you stick something under this and you are not too greedy, you actually get paid for drinking beer. Another thing that people use barcodes for is access control. Um, more often than you would actually expect, the access control system only verifies that the structure of the data is nice, which means that it can read a barcode, like it will not look at the content, not at all. Um, it's a really easy test, like when you have an access system that uses barcodes, just take your pack of cigarettes or whatever you currently have on you with a UPC and just scan it and see if the door opens. Um, don't be too surprised if it does, because that's like really a regular case. Um, other than that, you can just like get the right number of digits on your barcode and scan it and it will open the door. That frequently works. So an um, a attack, in quotes, because that's all really silly stuff, um, that I used, actually, is this, so desynchronization. The thing is, people do not realize that the barcode and the numbers that are, the digits that are actually printed below the barcode do not have anything to do with each other except for your assumption that this number is what the barcode says. Like, this is an assumption. And many people have that assumption, uh, which can be exploited. So um, what you do is you can just change it. Like, you can change the number or the barcode and leave the other one intact. And then, um, yeah, do stuff with it. Other people do that as well. Like, this is, we had a company trip to the zoo. Um, don't even ask. Um, <laughs> so this is the tickets we got, and of course I collected them all and skinned the barcodes. And this is what they do as well. The numbers that they show next to the barcode um, are the shorter ones, and when you decode the barcodes, you see the longer numbers there. And the leading digit actually says if you need to pay or not. Everything else is pretty much useless. So, desynchronization can be used for property tracking. Now, let us assume um, you work as a contractor at this company and your fellow co-contractor working next to you has this nice laptop. So, like, let's assume you have a Mac and you're like really finally understanding that they're crap and you want his IBM. Um, this is what you do. Um, in this company that I'm contracting there, um, they actually do property checking by um, you go and you get a barcode um, and stick it on your laptop and then they say this barcode belongs to this guy. So this is FX's laptop. And when you check out, they scan the barcode and they see if that's yours. So what you do is you replace the barcode on your badge. Just the barcode, not the number, temporarily with the barcode on the badge of the legitimate owner. Now, how do you know the value? Well, it's printed below, so you can just generate a barcode. You don't need any magic. Now, you stack that and stuck that on, um, go out, check it out, like check your new IBM laptop out, go back in, because right now um, he's not at work, but he's about to leave, so that does not, is not good, right? So you have to go back in, um, change your, fix your badge again, and then like remove it, and then check out and go home, and have two laptops. Easy as that. You can also use that um, for changing the identity of your laptop. Like many companies actually use the barcodes that are below your machine um, that actually contain the MAC address. They use that um, for port access security, for example. So you bring your laptop, then you scan the barcode, and then they know your MAC address and stuff. Of course, you can put a different MAC address in there. Um, so one of the ideas I had was like um, putting the broadcast MAC address in there, like all F. And so when they put it into the network access control system, it's gonna like fuck up the network. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
The thing about barcodes is it's a really simple technology, but you actually have to get your procedure right. Um, so this, this is what happens like when you're really lucky. So th this is actually a picture of the place, the apartment building I live in, and they put in a um, store, a automated DVD rental system, like unattended, right there. It had a barcode scanner at the door, and I walked right in there and like asked them for an account and like figured out that they're actually using biometric authentication. Like they wanted my fingerprint, and I'm like, yeah, you're gonna get my fingerprint this side. Um, so I only go for the pin. Um, now this is really cool because it's like unattended and it's in my house, and so I can like go at night and like play with their systems. Um, <laughs> So, okay, here's this. Here's the rental procedure and the pickup procedure. So the rental procedure is you go in, you swipe your card, you enter your PIN, you select the movie you want, you lock out. Um, you can do the same thing on their website. Now, the pickup procedure to actually get to the physical data carrier, the DVD, is you swipe your card, you get the DVD from the machine. Is anyone seeing an issue here? Well, the second doesn't ask for a PIN. So the card that you get actually has a barcode on it. The barcode is actually highly complicated. Um, there, yeah. Over there, like the, the top, um, it actually has like four digits and one character. Now the one character is actually um, pretty much static. It is, the, um, it is the first letter of your last name. And then the digits just like the numbers just increase. Which means you can just guess who just rented a movie, and then print a barcode with this number, swipe it, and if they ordered it over the web, you get it. Their problem is they cannot prove that they don't have it, so they have to pay for it. And you get to watch DVDs and even keep them. So, um, yeah, this is, this is what I did. Also, what's really funny, um, so on this website where you can like pre-order this stuff, um, they will actually tell you if it's rented out or not, and it will actually look a little bit different if it's already taken out or just reserved, so you already know what movies are um, rented and are pre-ordered, so you're not picking up like, I don't know, Disney crap. Um, yeah, it's good. So the next class that we have is injections and multi-decoding. Multi so most barcode readers, as I mentioned, actually um, read everything, like every possible type of barcode, and they're usually left in their factory setting because nobody cares. And even if they're not, we have learned already, we have configure barcodes, we can make them so again. The backend application, however, will in many cases only expect the barcode type it's written for. How surprise. Ever heard of people forgetting input validation? It is the same deal. So using a very powerful barcode like uh, code 128, um, you can inject arbitrary characters. That brings us to actually having SQL injections and format string attacks in barcodes. You will be surprised how good this works. The really interesting part of that is um, the older the application, the less likely that you actually succeed because people back in the days called actually code. And the later the application, like the latest PHP written shit, is going to fail all over you if you have a SQL injection barcode. This is actually, um, I had the pleasure of professionally like playing with barcodes as well. So this is actually from a medical system. Um, which is really important because it tests your blood for HIV. And you can actually, like, you see barcodes over there. Um, I found an injection in that system um, so that you could actually make, like, test results go away. Um, this is scary. You don't want to do that. Okay, I, I mentioned that people use barcodes for utter bullshit. Um, it's called QR codes. So the idea is this. You have a newspaper, like a Paper, paper, newspaper. Like, for us hackers, we probably don't have seen those in, like, years. But, like, a physical RSS, okay? So, um, and what the idea is, they print barcodes on the newspaper. And it is a two-dimensional barcode. And then there is commercial decoder software for your mobile phone 
uh, Nokia IT ships with one, I think, the latest, um, that will scan the barcode, decode the barcode automatically, and point your browser right at the URL this is pointing to. Um, this is actually a really, really bad idea. Now, yeah, here are some more of them. Um, the German newspapers, they actually started off with using them and, and said everyone else is using them now. Um, now, the thing is this. We took one of those commercial software thingies and, like, looked at it and realized that it's actually um, not even going to the newspaper's website, but it's just going to some Web 2.0 marketing bullshit company. Um, and... When you decode, like when you brute force the numbers, you can see who else is using this service, um, which is kind of nice, but it's not really barcode related. The problem here is this. People can actually print arbitrary content in newspapers. We call this advertisement. Like, this is how the newspapers actually make their money. So most people, especially most suit and tie wearing people, do actually trust their physical newspaper. Like, not only do they believe what they read in there, but they also do not think it could be evil content. So you're pointing your browser to a not-to-you-known URL automatically with your newspaper. Is that potentially a bad idea? Anyone? <laughs> like, have you ever heard of a vulnerable browser before? In you, all, you get to cross-site script people with your newspaper. Like, you put a cross-site scripting attack in the newspaper, he's locked into Gmail, he scans this shit, you delete all his email. This is like no, it's a no-brainer. It's like cross-site scripting 101. Like, how about just renting, like, very little advertisement space and then pointing it to, to an IcePack or MPEG site or, like, whatever exploitation framework you use against browsers and like owning mass owning managers. Now great, we have now to tell our CEOs they should not click on images in their fucking morning newspaper. Thank you. There is another great property of barcodes. Um, this is the density thing. The barcodes are actually designed to um, have a variety of density. The thing is, some of them are um, arbitrary length, so you can print as much as you want. Um, if you have a really long reader, that's not a problem. Um, but the, the programs, the software that is going to handle the barcode that you're just like giving it is actually written for this fixed amount of digits that it was expecting. So even in the same space, physical space, that you probably need like when you print it on a card or on a slip here in Vegas, you can actually print a lot more digits. Ever heard of buffer overflows before? Like, have you noticed that putting more stuff into something that it was expecting is actually something that hackers really like? So yes, it does happen. Like we did find buffer overflows with barcodes simply by just like printing more. Um, it is a lot less common than the injection attacks. But your tool of choice here is the code 128 because it's full 7-bit ASCII character set and you can chain them together. Like you print multiple of them and they end with a control called FC4 and that says, watch, um, there's more coming. And the barcode reader is actually caching that. So the barcode reader is actually like buffering all the barcodes you're scanning and then you send the final one and say, go! And then you finally scanned like a 1K big, bar, you know, 1K big barcode, which is kind of cool. I mean, really breaks shit. Um, warning, it is, I have to warn you, it is a pain to develop shell code on barcodes. <laughs> I can tell you from experience. Yeah, and coming back to this QR thing, like taking pictures in your newspaper and then routing your out, um, uh, browser to it, yeah, you put it into a disassembler. Um, right away, you find a place where they have a percent %s that, that they later on pass to a w's printf. Um, you also find, like, um, some phone number that is undocumented and, like, um, funny statements, and you find their username and their password for, like, some HP OpenView looking glass in their software. I don't actually know what that is, but, like, it was too cool to pass on. It has nothing to do with barcodes, but, like, if you want to own some, some fucked up Web 2.0 company, there it is. Um, we actually tested a lot of stuff that didn't break, 
So this is something we have in, in Germany. Um, it's called the PAC station. Um, you get a barcode in your mail. It's an EIN 13, and then you walk up to the station, and then um, you scan it, and it spits out the, the delivery that you got um, because the UPS guy, again, didn't find the door or something. So wait a sec. So what I'm spending my weekends with sometimes is like going to public barcode scanners and then fuzzing them. And this is how that looks like. So you have a few numbers, you have a few more numbers, more numbers, then you end up at some point with like very dense barcodes and SQL injection should be in here as well. Yeah, you have like special character sets and you just go there and scan them and see what happens. So this thing actually didn't crash, quite disappointing. Um, I also tried IKEA because they use Interleaf 205, um, which is a bit more powerful. You get more um, digits in. Um, and all their scanners accept almost all um, one-dimensional barcodes, but their application is actually well-written. It's one of these MS-DOS written programs, um, and it actually didn't crash. So, and then we have what I call recreation attacks, which means can I predict what the barcode is going to contain for a specific scenario that I want? If so, I can just print it out. It's that simple. So, the most obvious target is postal codes. Now, postal codes are used instead of stamps, right? So, they're actually worth money. So, um, they use two-dimensional barcodes now because they can automate the process. Like, they don't have to have an intern, like, licking stamps and, like, pasting them on letters, but they print the barcodes on the letters, and it goes a lot faster. Um, some of the postal systems, as we've in, seen in the intro, actually use um, different systems, but most actually use data matrix. And so I got just simple letters from, from companies that write me, um, like, invoices and stuff, and decoded them and checked out, like, what's in there, so what can you actually verify? So this is one thing that I got. Um, it has the Australian Post barcode over there, and I decoded it, and it is literally this line of zeros. Like, that's it. So how do you actually verify that someone paid for this letter with a bunch of zeros? Like, how do you do that? Probably not at all. So if you want to send mail in Austria, get, like, a bunch of zeros and put them in a barcode. They also had like real barcodes, but those were um, postal system barcodes and interleaf, and they just like had nothing to do with the payment. And then we have the US postal system. This is probably gonna get me in trouble. Um, so they have this labeling system that's called intelligent mail. Mm. And I assume um, it got this name because the, uh, compared to the author, the system was actually written there. Not getting there. <laughs> so, it uses code 128 labels. And I actually found the specs on the internet. Now, literally, like the doc file specs on the internet on how this works. So, here you see, like, the, um, how big this thing has to be and stuff. So, what's in a barcode? They have the spec in a barcode. So it says, here's this, the zip code. Yeah, it kind of makes sense here. Where should this go? Oh, and you, mind you, this only works for crates and, and big stuff, not for small letters. So um, do you have the zip code where it goes? Um, you have a CIN. You have a label source. So it says, like, where that, did it came from um, or what type? Um, you have a mailer ID, which is unique, and I'm coming to that in a minute, and a unique identifier for the shipment, and you have a label type, and that's about it. I don't see any authentication. Like, I don't see any way you can prove that is this is your mail or this wasn't your mail. Now, this unique identifier could be a problem because we're not able to predict it, but then in the same specs, it says, to maintain the uniqueness of the barcode, the data for these labor types must be unique for 30 to 45 days. Mailers are asked to check with their postal service marketing representative to confirm the requirement for uniqueness. Hmm. So, it's absolutely random. 
like it doesn't really care. Now on the other hand, I'm trying to get, uh, on the other hand, I compared that to another spec that at first sight has nothing to do that, with that. This is the Pentagon Building Security Emergency uh, Procedures Guide that also has a guide on how to handle mail and recognize letter bombs. So it has all those things like it is foreign mail or excessive postage or it actually has protuning wires and tin foil. Um, <laughs> whoever wrote that probably never built a bomb. It does not contain, you get a large shipment of a crate that has a um, sender ID of the Pentagon and then in that is actually the bomb. <laughs> like you can send pretty much everything anywhere for free and it will be trusted because the sender ID says like this is the Department of Defense. Um, do you guys use barcodes for boarding tickets, airline boarding tickets here in the States? Yeah? Okay, you're gonna love this. So, this is the latest trend. Um, so the security on our biggest hub, Frankfurt Main Airport, um, of course our capital doesn't have a large airport, um, relies on the boarding tickets. They don't actually have anything anymore except for the scanner that goes red or green, and if it goes green, you can go in, and if it's red, then no. Um, the security checkpoint is central, therefore, it's not airline specific, right? Now on the other hand, the security, um, like this implies that the security checkpoint may not know everyone who's already checked in because that would mean everything else is rewired with each other. And I don't think that is the case. So the validity must be in a barcode. I fly a lot. <laughs> so this is like barcodes from, from trips all over the place. Um, Here's some more. So I got all those and then I decoded them. And this is a tool I wrote myself for this barcode research so I can like color hex dumps and stuff. So um, this is what I found in the barcode. It has a passenger number, it has a last name, first name, booking code, from where you're flying to where you're flying, uh, which flight number, the day of the year, um, in which class you are flying, interesting, important, what seat you have, what your ticket number is, and a security check number. However, like the last row, uh, the last column here is the security check number. Do we notice a pattern? Yes, we do. <laughs> Everything else changes, security check number stays the same, bad. Turns out that thing is static. Now what's really scary is um, the two red ones that I have in there um, are actually online check-in boarding passes. So you check in on the website instead of at the counter. And they don't have anything in the second column. The second column is what is called the, um, the passenger record number. And everything, like literally everything in airline security, routing and whatnot depends on a PNR being there and correct and unique. Like all the airline software, everything works with PNR. Now they don't have a PNR, which means we don't have any piece of information we cannot predict. Um, so we can say from where to where we want to fly, what our name is, what flight we want to be on, what class we want to be on, and we are going to be like left uh, checked in, and they will like bring us to the gate. On the other hand, luggage tagging actually works by logically attaching a one-dimensional barcode to your trip and to you. So baggage is actually routed in the airport delivery system depending on this barcode. Um, and with online boarding, you can actually connect any piece of um, luggage that you have to your boarding pass simply by dropping it off at the counter. Like when you online check in, right? You check in online, then you got a bag, um, like a big trolley, you go like, mm, drop it at the counter, show them your online um, check-in boarding pass and they're connected logically to your trip which may not necessarily be yours. So here's the scenario. We have this person that is considered a potential terrorist because just he wears blankets. Um, and then we have his boarding pass. We have this other person um, who strangely looks like a government official in our country, um, who actually has an agent 
and wants to make this innocent blanket-wearing person look like a real terrorist. So he actually creates, recreates a boarding pass on the name of the other fellow and drops some luggage in with some extras, gets x-rayed, evil security, finds a terrorist. <laughs> this is how it works. You can totally do that. So, recommendation. I mean, they made water illegal in flights. They can actually make luggage illegal as well for security and anti-terror reasons. Um, because like the same concept as with the water is gonna apply here. You buy, a uh, you buy a bottle of water before you go to the airport, it's like $1. You buy it at the airport, it's like $5. They can do that with luggage too. Like, I don't see why we, why we should be allowed to have luggage for security reasons. There are some unsolved cases. Like one thing that I find really interesting is this US visit immigration thing that they used to have. It kind of like no longer is in use. So from, uh, for a period of time, you actually got like this huge barcode over there that looks like an antel. Um, when you checked out of the United States, like literally when you left the country, um, and I decoded those and they're like entirely crypto. And so I decoded those and they're entirely crypto and I decoded like a few train tickets in Germany and they're actually done right. They actually have a crypto certificate in the 2D barcode. This is how you do it. Like um, consider your barcode like a browser cookie. Whoever you give it to is gonna fuck with it. Like, if, it, if you give it to me, I'm gonna fuck with it. Uh, let's put it this way. And so everything that people will do to their cookies, they will potentially also do to their barcodes. If you can only use one dimensional barcodes, make really sure it is like a one-time pad. Like you, you draw a random number out of a non-Debian random number generator, and then um, you post it on whatever you want to tag, and then you have a central database where you um, put the stuff together and you don't tell anyone. Do not try to put information into one-dimensional barcodes. If you have a two-dimensional, use real crypto. Like the, the German systems, like the railway system and everything, they have done it right. They have actual crypto on the barcode, and it may actually provide for non-repudiation in both ways anyway. And make sure your process works. Like do not what my video store did. Um, make really sure that like the people cannot do something with the barcode just because you're implicitly trusted. Do not trust a printed number. I hope that was somewhat entertaining. If you have barcodes that you want to play with, generate barcodes or scan barcodes and decode them, um, we have on this funny URL, we have set up a wiki um, that contains all the, um, all the decoding software that we know and um, all the free decoding software and everything else and has some war stories of people um, like what went wrong with barcodes and um, actually people contributing content there. So it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> right on time, any questions? Any barcodes? <laughs> Uh, no, actually the slides are not on a disc because I was like getting myself into this talk Tuesday, something, so, but I will post them up the, and they should be up the Phenolic website. Oh, this is really funny, you're gonna love this. So if you have seen the, the Port Bunny talk that I gave together with Fabs, this system is actually like the, the backend is the other side, like the victim system that he tested his firewall um, detection packet storm shit against. So the system is actually broken right now because Fabs killed it and it's gonna be back up in a few days. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. See you at the next party.